In MS Paint, you can fill a whole area by the same color, but have you ever wondered what algorithm it uses to do so? It uses the flood fill algorithm, the one we will talk about in this video. The flood fill algorithm starts from a pixel, it replaces it with the new color, and it does the same thing with its four directional connected pixels. And so on until it reaches borders or pixels with a different color. For example, here we filled all the connected white area with red. The two main ways to implement this algorithm are depth-first search and breadth-first search. Yes, DFS and BFS, even if we're working on a 2D array and not a tree or a graph, because DFS and BFS are not used for trees and graphs only. If you're not comfortable with DFS and BFS, I suggest you to watch the videos I made about them before continuing this one. Let's start with DFS. To implement flood fill with DFS, the idea is that we start from a cell IG, replace its color with a new color, then we recursively call the function again four times. Once to fill starting from the bottom, once from the top, once from the right, and once from the left. It's the same principle we use with binary trees. We read the root, then we recursively call the function again, once to go from the left, and once to go from the right. So what's gonna happen is that the algorithm will go as deep as possible from the bottom, then it moves to another direction when it reaches the border or when it finds a cell with another color, and so on until it fills the whole connected area, as you can see with this animation. Okay, but what about the base case? A recursive function needs at least one base case, it would never stop otherwise. In our case, we have six base cases. When we reach the top border, when we reach the bottom border, when we reach the left border, when we reach the right border, when we already color the actual cell, and when the actual cell has a different color from the one we're replacing. If you aren't comfortable with recursion, you're probably wondering how did it go to the right when it reached the bottom border. I'm gonna answer that just after showing you the code. Our recursive function needs 5 parameters, the grid, the coordinates of the actual cell ing, the old color, which is the color we're replacing, and the new color. Now we store the number of rows and the number of columns in n and m respectively, and we can start working. We said that we have 6 base cases, but we can put them in one condition and separate them with OR operators. We write, if i is smaller than 0, or i is greater than or equal to n, or g is smaller than 0, or g is greater than or equal to m, or the value of the actual cell isn't equal to the one we're replacing. We darkly exit, we do nothing. Else, the recursive case, we replace the value of the actual cell with the new one, and we call the function 4 times. Once with i plus 1 g to go to the bottom, once with i minus 1 g to go to the top, once with i g plus 1 to go to the right, and once with i g minus 1 to go to the left. And in the non-recursive function, we first detect the color of the cell from where we start. And if it's equal to the new color, we don't even call the recursive function, because here we'll just gonna color the area with the same color, so nothing will change. Else, we call the recursive function we made now to fill the area with the new color starting from the cell IG. Now back to our question, how did it go to the right? The algorithm colored the cell, then it called the function again with i plus 1 G, so it stops and waits for it to end. Then this call does the same thing, then this one, and so on until the bottom. Now when it calls with i plus 1 G, it enters the base case, because it went out of the grid, i is equal to n, so it directly returns, it backtracks. Now the call to the bottom ended, it moves to the one that goes to the top, but it also enters the base case because the color is different from the one we're replacing. Remember, we're replacing white cells and the actual one is red. It means that we already filled it, so we also backtrack. Next call, i g plus 1, the one that goes to the right. Here it enters the recursive case, so it fills the cell and it recursively calls the function again to continue. And this is what's gonna happen until we finish all the recursive calls. The time complexity of this function is O of n times m, where n and m are the dimensions of the grid, because in the worst case, it needs to fill the whole grid, and a grid has n times m cells. And for the space complexity, each recursive call adds a frame to the call stack, so we can end up with n times m frames, this is why the maximum call stack size is n times m, we end up with a space complexity of O of n times m. Now let's move to the BFS approach. When applying BFS to a tree, we read the root and we put its children in the queue. 
Then we dequeue the next node, we read it, and we enqueue its children, and so on until the queue becomes empty. In our case, we call the initial cell and we enqueue its four directional connected cells. Then we dequeue a cell from the queue, we color it, and we enqueue its four directional connected cells. And so on until the queue becomes empty. What's gonna happen is that the area will get filled level by level, as you can see. First the initial cell, then the ones that are one cell away from it, then two cells away, and so on. But to make sure that the loop stops at some point, we need to verify a condition before reading a cell. It's the same condition as for DFS. We have to make sure that we didn't get out of the grid, didn't already color the actual cell, or the color is different from the target color we're working with. So in code, we put the dimensions of the grid in N and M, we get the color we're gonna replace, which is the color of the cell IG, we check that the old color and the new color are different, then we can start. We said that we need a queue, so we create a queue, we enqueue the coordinates of the initial cell, and we can start looping. While the queue is not empty, we dequeue the coordinates of the next cell, then we check the condition. If that condition is true, then we don't read the actual cell, because either it doesn't exist, or we already colored it, or its color is different, so we just continue to move to the next iteration. Else, we call our grid of IG with a new color, and we enqueue the coordinates of its four neighbors, I plus 1G, I minus 1G, IG plus 1, and IG minus 1. And same as with the DFS approach, the BFS approach of the float fill algorithm has an O of n times m time and space complexity, time for the same reason, and space because of the queue. Now that we've seen how the float fill algorithm works, let's apply it to images. We will work with the PIL Python module. It will allow us to open images, get, and set the color of a pixel. For the float fill algorithm, we just change a few things. The grid becomes the image, i and g become y and x respectively because with pixels we usually work with x and y. The dimensions n and m become the height and the width of the image respectively, and we read and write the color of a pixel by using getPixel and putPixel methods respectively. Now in the main function, we open the image, we select the new color, red for example, we select the pixel from where we start, the one at position 1500s, 800s for example, and we call the function, and this is what happens. You can see that all the white area got filled with red, which is what we wanted to do. Three things before ending this video. First one, the BFS approach is usually more preferable than the DFS one, because it doesn't require call stack space, which can be limited sometimes. And it also starts by visiting closed cells, which is better when searching for the shortest distance for example. Second thing, obviously. There exist Python libraries to float fill an image. You don't need to implement the float fill algorithm to do so. Here we did it for learning purposes. And third thing, what if we have a grid made of landed water? How can we use the float fill algorithm to count the number of islands? For example, here we have six islands. Try to think about it. We will solve it in the next video. Subscribe to the channel to not miss it. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Leave a like and a comment, and see you in the next one.